in the name of Jesus drought in your life that even when it is physical rainy season it is still dry season spiritually financially and otherwise I decree and declare let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall you welcome to another spirit filled message on christocentric message if you're new to this channel i would entreat you to hit on that subscribe button and then to like this video as well i would want you to share this message across because we believe that as this message is coming forth it's going to bless you your graces are going to be imparted onto you and then god is going to visit your home thank you for watching stay blessed the patterns of god are so powerful that for as long as you walk in keeping with those patterns it is impossible to go down his integrity listen carefully his integrity is back of his word his integrity is back of his patterns this is what gives us the confidence to know that if he did it yesterday he will do it again today and we can predict tomorrow with accuracy that may sound like pride because of the consistency of his character that by these two immutable things the bible declares that it is impossible for god to lie this is our confidence this is our consolation hallelujah so you have come tonight i beseech you that your heart be open you have not come to meet a politician you have not come to meet an earthly monarch. You have not come to meet some ambassador. You have come to Jesus, the head of the church. The one today exalted both Lord and Christ. Hallelujah. The multi-breasted one. And the Bible says they looked unto him and their faces were lightened. May the Lord do us good tonight. In Jesus mighty name we pray let me one more time salute all those who are worshiping with us for the first time thank you very much remains an honor to have you worship with us and for our family connecting online our Zaria family and our global family blessings and grace to you in the name of Jesus Christ koinonia is a place that God has covenanted even with himself that this is a house of encounters. This is a place of transformation, a place of revival indeed. And this is a place where the multifaceted possibilities of the spirit are allowed to find expression unrestrained. And tonight will not be any different in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. As always, were committed to bringing you the Word of God. You know, I was thinking whilst preparing to come to church that the teaching of the Word of God, please listen, the teaching of the Word of God in partnership with the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the only platform for the enlightenment of the saints. The saints are not enlightened just by passion. The saints are not even enlightened just by desire it will take more than desire and it will take more than passion for the saints to be enlightened it will take the ministry of the teaching priest in partnership with the holy spirit to bring genuine enlightenment that leads to transformation how do you know that what you are receiving is light indeed two things number one john 1 5 the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not so if it is light indeed it must sustain the power to veto the presence and the influence of darkness the bible says that was the true light that means there are false lights information that carry a semblance of liberty but they do not sustain within them the power to set free indeed that was the true light that lighted every man. When it has to do with the ministry of light, every man is qualified to have access to light. There are realities in the spirit where the Bible will say he gave unto some 
But when it has to do with the ministry of light, it says that was the true light which lighted every man, regardless race, regardless background. That was the light, the true light which lighted every man. Hallelujah. The sun, as we know, is older than every man on earth. Yet, its illumination and its strength, its ability to shine has never diminished. Are we together now? That is the excellency of light. That light does not sustain within it the weakness of fading. Light is consistent in its illumination. Every time light seems to fade, the problem is not the light. The problem is the object reflecting it. So there are times on earth where the nighttime looks very dark. It is simply the problem of the alignment of the moon, not the illumination of the sun. As for the sun, it remains ever bright. And the Bible says the path of the just is as a shining light. Is that in your Bible? That shineth more and more. More and more is the destiny of every believer in Christ, even unto the perfect day. May you find light tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. It takes light to rule. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel. Once that lamp is lit, it is impossible to hide it. Hallelujah. And so it's important for you to be very intentional about your receiving the word of God. Don't be careless about it at all. Jesus gave a parable and it was the parable of the sower. And he said that a sower came and sowed good seed but on four different kinds of soils. Are we together? And they produce several kinds of harvest for even the soils that were good, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. That means it is the responsibility of every believer to open up your heart because the Bible tells us how to be a good soil. It says the one that fell on good soil are they that heard the word and understood it. So your hearing and your understanding is what makes you a good soil. Praise the name of the Lord. Tonight, I want to teach on a topic that I believe is going to speak to so many of us. I believe that this topic will give us wisdom, will give us intelligence, will mature our understanding as to the ways of God and will help us to be able to command greater levels of victory because this is the assignment of the teaching priest. According to Jeremiah 3 and verse 15, it says, and I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart. It says they will feed you with knowledge and they will feed you with understanding. It says, and that from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which is able to make you wise unto salvation. Hallelujah. So when the word of God is taught, it helps you to understand the ways of God and it fades away ignorance from your Christian experience. In the presence of light, you can now walk in dominion. Hallelujah. Dominion is not a possibility outside of light. It takes light to dominate. Psalm, I mean Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1. It says, arise, shine. Not because you are tired of sitting down. It says, for your light is come. Amplified will say, arise from the depression and the prostration that circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm teaching tonight on a topic that I title, The Afflictions of the Righteous. And I want you to please pay attention. You would be learning a lot tonight. The Afflictions of the Righteous. Psalm 34 and verse 19. Help us, Spirit of the living God. We depend on your wisdom. The Bible says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Then it says, But the Lord delivered him out of them all. Two very powerful information. Number one, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And then number two, it says, the Lord delivered him out of them all. Say amen. amen. 
Second scripture, please. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Romans 8, 28. The Bible says, and we know, this is an information that is privy only to believers. It is not general knowledge. It says, and we know, we who are of the fold, we who are people who have submitted to the word. He said there is an information we know that gives us the staying power through negative seasons. He says, and we know that all things work together for good, not to everybody, to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Can we look at one more scripture? Second Corinthians chapter 4, please, 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17 and 18. Here's what Paul says. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, he says, walketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 18 says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, he says, for the things which are seen are temporal, subject to change. But the things which are not seen are eternal. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Hallelujah. Now, to start tonight, the Bible teaches us that we have been called as believers into a life of victory. That for the believer, there is a very definite implication when you give your life to Jesus Christ as we know you receive of his life and you surrender your life to him. The Bible tells us, number one, that there is a translation from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Number two, the Bible tells us that you become the righteousness of God in Christ because now you have access through Christ to that gift of righteousness. Are we together? Then the Bible tells us according to John chapter 10 and verse 10 that for believing in Jesus, you have access to that life. I am come that ye may have life and that you may have that life more abundantly. Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and when we get to verse 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Greek word zoe. 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, it says, but that the world through him might be saved. So there are many implications um, to being a believer. When you become a believer, you are not an ordinary person. Among other things, the Bible tells us that you are the righteous. Are we together? You are a bona fide recipient of the life of God. You now sustain the potential to walk in victory. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57, the Bible says, Now thanks be to God, 1 Corinthians 15, and 57, 5, 7. Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory and that that victory comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's important for us to know that the Bible teaches in a very clear and unmistaken way that believers are called to a life of victory. You must have that at the back of your mind. Number two is that the basis for the believer's victory in the kingdom is the finished work of Christ. You must be able to defend your confidence as to the fact that you should live a victorious life because situations and circumstances will challenge that victory. The basis for the believer's victory in the kingdom is the finished work of Christ. That means the summation of everything Jesus did from his death, his burial, and his resurrection. This is the basis. Listen, as simple as this point is, if you do not know what is the basis for your victory, you will just become a religious person who is speaking what seems to be right, but it does not sustain any power in the spirit because the anointing is released on the strength of understanding, understanding, understanding. It is not what you say or do that releases power. It is the understanding that supports what you say or what you do. So this is a kingdom that is predicated upon understanding. 
the spirituality and the correctness of your activity notwithstanding. That means you can act correctly, you can even speak correctly, but from a standpoint of ignorance, it will not produce any results. Are we together? The sons of Sceva were saying the correct thing. We adjure you by Jesus. The statement was correct, but the requisite understanding that will release the power to back what they were saying was not there. So it is not just what we do in terms of its correctness. It is the spiritual understanding that supports our speakings and our doings that releases the power of God. Ephesians 4.18 says, having their understanding darkened. It says, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. In fact, the assignment of the prince of this world, as Paul taught us, is to blind the minds of the people. Are we together now? So the Bible teaches that we have been called unto a life of victory in Christ. And the Bible teaches us that the singular basis for the believer's victory is on the strength of that which Christ has done. Of course, in partnership with our understanding and our acting upon that truth, even in faith. Are we following so far? The third point I want us to know as a foundation tonight is that the Bible is also very clear as to the fact that there will be moments of affliction. Listen now. Haven't established the fact that the word of God is clear as to the believer's heritage and destiny of perpetual victory. And the Bible tells us that the basis for our victory is Christ and that which he has done. Are we together? But the Bible also is not silent as to the fact that believers will face moments of afflictions, losses, pain, and challenges. You would think the Bible should be silent about these issues, but the Bible is very clear as to the fact that there will be moments of afflictions, there will be moments of losses, there will be moments of pain and challenges in the life of the believer. Psalm 20, please, from verse 1 to 5. The psalmist wrote it so beautifully. He said, the Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. So the psalmist identifies such a moment in the life of the believer called the day of trouble. This was not negative confession. He's saying in my study, even as a king, I have come to a point where there are time periods in the lives of men, even those who are of the fold, even the covenant people, that there is such a day called the day of trouble. It says, the name of the God of Jacob defend thee, verse 2, send thee help in that day of trouble from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Verse 3, it says, remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt offerings. We're reading to 5, verse 4, grant thee according to thine own heart to fulfill all thy counsel. The last verse, it says, we will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God will we set up our banners. It says, the Lord will fulfill all our petitions. So the psalmist is saying that there is a day called the day of trouble hallelujah several examples we can find in scripture of men and women who were purported to be righteous and yet had moments and seasons of very very disheartening conditions an example was as we find in scripture an example is Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 15 from verse 1 to 3 the Bible tells us that after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram. He says, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Can you imagine this kind of salutation? And yet Abraham was in the midst of something that was a serious problem. Verse 2, it says, And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is the Eliezer of Damascus, verse 3. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is my heir. Do you know what he was saying? Thank God for all these wonderful salutations, but I'm in the middle of a situation. This is what matters to me right now. I go childless. In fact, when you read chapter 16 and verse 1, give us 16 verse 1. The Bible tells us now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bear him no children. 
can you imagine that this this is Abraham that the Bible would call the friend of God this is Sarai his wife and yet even as people who were so close to God they had such an issue in their life trusting God for the fruit of the womb and the Bible is not silent about that story. You would think the Bible would just wrap it up and say Abraham was a great man, came from Ur of the Chaldeans, was a noble man, received a promise from God, finally offered Isaac and became a great man. That's an intelligent way to summarize the Bible. But the Bible goes to be that detail to tell us the concerns of that man Abraham. Are we together? Example number two. Israel. In the land of Egypt the Bible records that Israel God's own chosen people his covenant people were in captivity you find that in Exodus chapter 1 um, the full text is 1 to 14 but let's jump to verse 8 for the sake of time hallelujah is someone learning already that the nation of Israel God's covenant people were in captivity and did you know for all that 430 years God still called them my people and they still identified him as their God and yet they were in captivity now there arose a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph verse 9 it says, and he said unto his people, behold, I hope you know that the captivity of the nation of Israel started as a plan to manage fear and jealousy. That was what led, graduated to become 430 years of captivity. Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also our enemies and fight us. That was the whole basis for subjugating them. There was a time they were equal in terms of ranking and privileges. But another king came up and said, no, we can't let this happen. One day they will become allies with our enemies and they will defeat us. And so they suggested captivity and bondage as a strategy to keep them limited. Are we together now? And verse 11 now for time. The Bible says, Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramesses. These were gods in Egypt. And you read down to 14, it just tells you the captivity that God's own people went through. How will you imagine that God, who is the mighty God, is watching from heaven and not for two years, not for ten years. This is the longest time officially recorded that God's people went into captivity consciously under their taskmasters. Hallelujah. Example number three is the mysterious story of Job. We find that in chapter one down to chapter two. Just write it for reference. Up till this day, it has remained a theological debate as to the, the real spiritual lesson behind the story of Job because it takes extreme level of spiritual intelligence, discernment, work with God to be able to decipher the book of Job is, is laced with all kinds of confusion. It starts by telling us of a noble man, the greatest and the wisest as his time in the East. And the Bible records that he was a man that feared the Lord and eschewed evil. Qualified to be called a righteous man by the standard, whatever standard was there. Now the Bible tells us that there was a summon in the heavenlies. This is where the story gets very interesting. And that Satan was also there. The Bible never called him Lucifer. At this time, it identifies him already as Satan. This is a very disturbing scripture. Because when you read from the banishing of Satan from heaven, the Bible says a place was no longer found for him in heaven. And yet the Bible says Satan came among them. So this can be an endless debate among theologians. That's not our goal tonight. I'm just showing you that there is such a disturbing reality and you find it in the Bible. Are we together now? And then a discussion happens in heaven and based on the text, 
Satan is given permission to touch everything around Job except his life. Then the Bible says that there was a day on earth. Can you see that the manifestation of affliction and all kinds of evil also work with times? There was a day on earth for the execution of that which was finished in the spirit. And the Bible says one report after report, the sons, his cattle, all kinds of things happened to that man. But I love something that the Bible says happened to Job. It says that with all of these things that Job bowed his head and worshipped. What an, what an interesting, what an interesting expression. Do you know what it means that in one day you lose your daughters, you lose your sons, you lose your business, you lose everything. And the Bible says he shaved himself, he fell down and worshipped. Example number four, are we learning? The Bible talks about a wonderful woman in scripture called Ruth. You find that in Ruth chapter 1 and we'll read from verse 1 to 5. Now there are two women who had the privilege of their names as books of the Bible. One is Esther, the other is Ruth. Hallelujah. The Bible says it came to pass in the days when judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife had two sons. He's talking about Naomi now. The Bible says his name was Elimelech and then the wife was Naomi. And then they had two sons, Malon and Chilion. And they got married to Ruth and to Oprah. Are we together? Just rushing for sake of time. Let's go to verse 4 for the sake of time. We're reading to 5. The Bible says they took them wives of the women of Moab and one was called Oprah and the other was called Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. Watch affliction. Watch tragedy. The Bible says the two sons also died. I don't know what kind of spirit was working there but the husband of Naomi died and then the sons that got married to them also died the bible says and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband separated from them and you know the story that looked like the end of Ruth's life in fact the woman told them when you read the full text he said look go and find husbands for yourself just leave me I'm a woman with many sorrows and then Oprah went and Ruth refused and that led to a series of events that will finally connect her to Boaz and now you know from history that she was part of the genealogy of Jesus many are the afflictions of the righteous are we learning he says but the Lord delivered him from them all still giving examples example number five jesus himself you would think because he's the son of the living god the creator of the ends of the earth he would be exempted from affliction when you read from luke chapter 22 all through for sake of time you just write it the bible tells us that jesus himself got to a point where he had to stand before Pontius Pilate. In fact, right from Gethsemane, he looked at the people when they came with swords and all of that. He said, why are you using knives to come and catch me? I was all around with you in the temple. What offense have I committed? But this is your hour and the power of darkness, he said. Am I right on that? And Jesus was caught, malhandled in, you know, with the council, Pontius Pilate, and you know the story, went through all kinds of things until he died even the death on the cross. The cross is a very interesting place, I have taught you. The cross is the place where both good and bad people meet. There were three crosses there at Golgotha, and there were three men there. One among them was Jesus and the other were thieves. So be careful who you talk about on the cross. You might be talking about Jesus. The cross is a mysterious place like the prison where both good and bad people are. Hallelujah. Jesus. Number six, giving you examples from scripture. The Bible talks about Peter, the early apostles. Now Peter in Acts chapter 12 from verse 1 to 4, know the story. That's the story of Peter. The Bible says, Herod stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. Reading to verse 4, it says verse 2, and he killed James. Can you imagine? James, the brother of John with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. 
and verse 4 the bible says that he apprehended peter and he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending that after easter he would bring him forth to the people you would think a great apostle who just preached peter preached the official sermon to launch the manifestation of the ministry of the holy spirit how will a man filled with the holy spirit mentored directly by jesus received they were the first fruits of the ministry that ushered in the dispensation of the spirit and yet this man was now bound as a criminal kept in prison hallelujah do i talk about paul and silas in acts chapter 16 that this man the bible says that they went to preach and they found a certain damsel who was possessed by the spirit of divination and by the authority of the spirit they casted that demon out and then the bible tells us that as a result they will lay them they flog them and put them in prison you can imagine paul and silas in prison bound hand and feet many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivered them from them all. Now, please listen carefully. I wrote something down here. I said, believers must be trained to know and respond to these periods of affliction and challenges. Believers must be trained. Because you see, we live in a world where because of the loud proposition of our victory in Christ, most believers are at a loss when they begin to face moments where they cannot understand what is happening around their lives, their families, and many believers have turned away from the things of God because of the negative situations and circumstances around them, their lives. Because they've tried to find meaning and perspective as to why some of these things, I understand the affliction of the sinner, the Bible says, mark the wicked, their end is destruction. So I don't need to ask why the wicked is being punished. I don't need to ask why the wicked is being destroyed. But the Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. The destruction of the sinner is imminent. Based on God's justice system and based on the laws of the spirit. Because the Bible says that... Um, how does he put it now? It says, good understanding procured favor. That is um, Proverbs 13, 15. It says, but the way of the transgressor is hard. The transgressor is the violator of God's principles. So when people violate principles and become wicked, their end is already predicted from scripture. Now, but how do you reconcile the righteous seeming to go through the same experience as the wicked? In the face of challenges, what then is the excellency of righteousness? What then is the excellency of godliness? By reason of what I do, almost on a daily basis without exaggeration, I receive calls and text messages from people, many of them believers, seeking explanation, communicating their various annoyance and lamentations as to many things that may have befallen them from bereavements, there are people who have lost loved ones and some of the loved ones at the point of death, they were saying by his stripes, I am healed. And yet they still died. How do you explain that to an unbeliever? How do you explain people who got into all kinds of trouble because they refused to give bribe or collect bribe? They stood for their integrity and made up their minds that they would not compromise. And you would think their refusal, you know, their, their, their rejecting compromise should immediately bring them to elevated positions of honor. Many of them went through declines, sadly, even unto death. How about Matthiadom? Those who stood for Jesus, even at the point of death. Hallelujah. How about believers who have trusted releasing their hearts, releasing their all? How about believers who emptied their accounts, serving the purposes of the kingdom? And there seemed to have been a boomerang effect that has affected them when the pandemic struck, it, it hit believers, it hit unbelievers alike. And let me tell you the truth. If explanation and perspective is not given to this, we are going to lose many believers in the days that come because many people will be confused. I understand the affliction of the wicked, 
but it is difficult to understand the affliction of the righteous hallelujah as a man of God I have seen miracles all kinds of manifestations of God's power and I'm indebted to God eternally for trusting us with this grace and apostleship to do the things we have done but I have had to stand and weep with people at their funerals I've had to comfort families I've also had to you know just keep quiet and give God the glory because in in spite of the spiritual intelligence and the grace given we have been confronted even as men of God with situations where it is wisest to just be silent because any other thing you say will be a communication of foolishness in light of that kind of catastrophe there are times that believers are so plagued with certain situations that the best way the best way is just to say Lord we thank you we may not understand but we thank you hallelujah I have studied this myself and by the Spirit of God I have come up with five keys and this is really the core of my teaching tonight I want you to please pay attention I guarantee you that you will need this teaching in your life and with it you'll be able to help others and if you're a man of God here please lend me your attention because you will be confronted with situations that will require this level of spiritual understanding there are five keys that are found from Scripture that is able to help the righteous to not only manage afflictions but to turn that affliction to victory even in the spirit you see we agree from scripture that challenges are not unusual in fact here's what Jesus said in this world you will have tribulation Jesus is speaking he says but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world this is not a prophet this is not some apostle this is Jesus the Christ himself saying in this world there is a guarantee that you will have this and that tribulation he says but be of good cheer I have overcome the world hallelujah there are five biblical keys that the Bible gives the believer as the keys that will help them to experience victory in spite of or in the midst of challenges are you ready for the five keys pray in the spirit for one minute and ask the Lord to open your understanding give us understanding even by your word many are the afflictions of the righteous the righteous businessman the righteous apostle the righteous prophet the righteous mother the righteous student the righteous politician even the righteous nation hallelujah key number one key number one are you ready the first key that the Bible gives now you must understand that the Word of God is not a recommendation that the Word of God is not an opinion it may look like a recommendation it may look like an opinion but for the believer who wants to walk perpetually in victory the Word of God is life the Word of God is instruction it says my son pay attention to my words incline your ears to my sayings it says do not let them depart from your heart keep them in the midst of your, your your mouth keep them in the midst of your heart he said they are life not to everybody to those that find them and health even to their flesh so you must take the Word of God as final authority as touching anything the Word of God presents the mind of God concerning any and all matters are we together number one the first key any believer any righteous person who is going through a season of affliction doesn't matter what it is called the first recommendation from scripture is to look unto Jesus please write as simple as that sounds do not assume you understand what I'm saying just write and listen to look on to Jesus to look on to Jesus now we can read Psalm 34 beginning from verse 1 look on to Jesus it says I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth verse 2 my soul shall make her boast in the Lord the humble shall hear of and hear thereof and be glad verse 3 it says oh magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together for 
I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Five. It says they looked unto him. Is that in your Bible? And they were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. Verse six. It says the poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Reading to 10. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Verse 8. It says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. Verse 9. O oh, fear the Lord ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. Final verse. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. It says, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Say loud, amen. amen. Hallelujah. So the Bible says to look unto Jesus. You find that in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, he says, the author and the finisher of our faith. Please look up. I can tell you it is very difficult to look unto Jesus in the face of challenges, tribulations. What does it mean to look? Now pay attention. To look means to direct one's gaze and focus towards someone or something. That's what it means to look. To look means to direct one's gaze, to direct one's focus away from other things towards someone or towards something. But then to look also means to rely on or to depend totally upon. When the Bible says look unto Jesus, Number one, it means to set your gaze upon him, not wavering whatsoever. But number two, it means to depend and rely totally upon him. Even when you do not understand him, look unto Jesus. The biblical recommendation for managing seasons and moments of affliction. Look unto Jesus. The Bible says, there is a very strange and interesting story. You find that in Numbers chapter 21 from verse 4 down to 9. The Bible talks about the nation of Israel that when they came by the way of the Red Sea, the Bible says to compass the land of Edom. The soul of the people was discouraged because they kept walking endlessly and it looked like there was no victory, no rest for them. They were hungry, they were angry, and the trouble started from verse 5. Reading to verse 9. The people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, there is no water, and our soul loathed this light bread. Verse 6, the Bible says the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they beat the people and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. He says, pray unto the Lord that he takes away the serpent from us. And Moses prayed for the people. How did God answer the prayer? The Lord instructed Moses and said, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is beaten, when he looketh upon it, shall leave. What kind of an instruction is that? What is the relationship between a serpent, a brazen serpent, and healing, and life, and victory? It was not about the serpent. He was teaching them that there is life and dominion in trusting God's plan, in trusting God's way. As foolish as it is, once it is God that has spoken, he's saying even in the midst of the fiery serpents, the wisest thing to do in front of a snake is to run away, not to look. Hallelujah. It is stupid for someone to sit down and watch a serpent curl around you. Are we together now? And it's about to kill you. The wisest human instruction is to run away. Not to look at some serpent somewhere. And yet, that is the foolishness of God's path. He was teaching them that the ways of God may not make sense, but in them there is life. Look and leave, my brother, leave. Look to Jesus Christ and leave. It is recorded in his word. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Tis only that you look and believe. Apostle, you have no idea what is happening in my life right now. It's on account of my faith in Jesus that I'm in this trouble right now. Look to Jesus. Hallelujah. To depend upon him. Psalm 1, 2, 3 from verse 1 and 2. 1, 23, 1 and 2. The Bible says, Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Verse 2. It says, Behold, as the eyes of the servant look upon the hand of their masters. It says, And as the eyes of the maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon thee, O Lord, until that he have mercy upon us. Can I tell you? There's no time, but probably let me just give you three scriptures that helps us to know why should you look unto Jesus. Number one is found in Psalm 127. I hope I've not lost you. We're still looking at the first reason or the first recommendation from scripture to look to Jesus. Psalm 127 from verse 1 and 2 says, Except the Lord builds a house, I am showing you why you need to look unto Jesus, that they labor in vain that build it, and except the Lord keepeth the city, the watchmen walketh but in vain. Verse 2 says, It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrow, for he giveth his beloved sleep. Why do we need to look unto Jesus? Romans chapter 9 and verse 16. It says, It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but it is of the Lord that showeth mercy. That means no matter what else you do, you can stretch your human imagination from border to border. If God does not show you mercy, everything you are doing will end up being moving around in circles. Hallelujah. Why do we need to look unto Jesus? Psalm 62 and verse 11. I have spoken once and twice have ye heard that power belongeth to God. When you look unto Jesus, you are looking unto the only person, the only God who has the power to do something about your situation. My Bible tells me some trust in horses and some trust in chariots. It says, but we will trust in the name of our God. This is true. Men can want to help. They may be sincere on that, but do they have the power? Hallelujah. Someone say, look unto Jesus. Let me give you one more scripture. Why do you need to look unto Jesus? At times of adversary, at times of pain Psalm 133 from verse 1 behold how good and how pleasant it is Psalm 113 my apologies 113 113 113 praise ye the Lord praise ye his serv the servants of the Lord praise the name of the Lord verse 2 it says blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth forever verse 3 it says, from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Uh -huh. We're reading to verse 9. The Lord is high above all the nations and his glory above the heavens. Watch this now. It says, who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high? Verse 6. Who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and are in earth? 7. Who raised the poor? I'm showing you why you need to look unto Jesus. God is the only one who can raise men, the poor, out of the dust and lifted the needy out of the dunghill. That he may set him to sit with princes, even the princes of his people. Verse 9. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. This is what he can do. When you look unto Jesus, it may sound like foolishness in the midst of challenges because there are many times I have taught you here when God is silent, the most difficult phase in the believer's life is when God is silent. Even though he is the word, there are times God is mysteriously silent. And I've taught you that the silence of God is also a language. You must know what God is saying when he's not speaking because when God is not speaking he's saying something 
look unto Jesus. Now, let me give you a word of caution. We're looking at five keys. And the Spirit of God had to put it in my heart to write this down. According to Matthew 11 and verse 6, it says, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Can I tell you? If you've not had the temptation to be offended in God, it's either you are really a baby or you've not lived long enough on this earth. Because there are moments in your life when you feel, it's, it's almost as if you feel cheated for loving Jesus. Are we together? Yeah. John came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Watch this. John was the prophet who ordained Jesus to ministry. It was revealed to John. John had the secret code that would identify Jesus. When he saw Jesus by prophecy, he said, Behold the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Now John is locked up, courtesy Herodias, the daughter, as a birthday gift. He was locked up and was about to be beheaded in anger. When the disciples came to him, you know what he said? The same person who identified Jesus, who announced him, he said, go and ask him, are you the Messiah or should we expect another? That is what offense can do. The man who ordained Jesus in ministry, in fact, he trained some of the disciples who would later be the disciples of Jesus. And yet he said, Jesus, for I, I've, my pain vetoes every vision I have about you. My pain vetoes anything God told me about you. I am in a moment of pain. You claim to be the Messiah and now I am locked up in prison and you do not even have the courtesy to come and visit me. I hear a rumor that as a birthday gift, my head is going and you do not even show any sign of concern. Take that message to your Jesus. The disciples come to Jesus in a crusade ground. And says, sir, we don't mean to embarrass you, but there's a serious situation. The man who announced you most, the man who cried out and said he was the voice who was sent to bear witness to you, is in total doubt of you right now. What can destroy a man's ministry more than somebody who loved you and endorsed you openly? And is now saying, go, I'm not even sure of what I laid hands on. And the Bible says, Jesus... With calmness and intelligence, he turned and began to lay hands, healed a few people. He said, go and tell John what you see. The blind see, the deaf hear, and so on and so forth. The gospel is preached. Then he says, 11 verse 6 now, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Lord, where were you when I was losing my job? Where were the angels of protection when my loved one was being attacked by terrorists or died in a car crash? I don't mean to get you emotional, but I'm just, I'm discussing on the afflictions of the righteous. Lord, where were you when for the sake of my integrity as a man of God, I seem to have gone down? Where were you when Potiphar's wife was all around Joseph and because of his integrity, he didn't go to the palace, he went to the prison. The afflictions of the righteous. How do you explain Joseph holding a woman's, uh, the wife's, um, what they call it now? Her veil or whatever it is he was holding. How could he say that he did not have anything to do with her? That was evidence enough. And yet God was watching in heaven. How do you explain Hannah crying year after year? going to Shiloh. How do you explain that? How do you explain God's people under the rule and bondage of the Egyptians? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Let me tell you this. The believer is not a believer because of results. The believer is a believer because you have committed yourself to trust in Jesus. Hallelujah. Look unto Jesus is the first biblical recommendation. I've had very painful experiences in the lives of people as I, as I serve the purposes of God. And sometimes, you know, when they can't see Jesus, you who is the closest to him based on what they perceive, whatever they would have told him is what they tell you. 
Hallelujah. Since I cannot see Jesus, you claim to be the one who has come in his name, you better be prepared to help me convey to Jesus. And I will tell you loud and clear, where was he when this happened? I know many people who I called in maybe the face of bereavement and whatever, and I say, can we say a word of prayer? And they say, Apostle, with all due respect, please do not talk to me about anything prayer now. And I know that they don't mean it. It's just what pain can do. Hallelujah. I heard about the story of someone who had an accident and he had to rush out and he stood watching his car burn and it burned to ashes. There was absolutely nothing he would have done. And that was a car that was like two months old. What was the value of dedicating the car in church? They poured oil on that car and it still burnt after two months. How about the business of believers that went down from COVID? And some of those people were great sponsors of the gospel. Now, just follow me. I'm a good pilot who will land well. You just follow me. Hallelujah. Mm. How about a man of God who gathered sick people and shouted in the name of the Lord that they will be healed and laid hands on them one by one till they arrested him and threw him out of that place. And he left that crusade ground as if he was living a funeral. Where is the Jesus I kept shouting and talking about? Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not just playing with words, nor am I playing with your mind. I'm revealing something that may be someone's situation right now. And you know, in the midst of challenges, you forget every title you have. You forget every, even Jesus wept. Very disturbing scripture. John 11, 35. If you see Jesus weeping, will you not cry too? That means you are in trouble. John eleven thirty five. 35. The comforter of those who were always weeping is now weeping. It doesn't matter why he's weeping. The fact that you saw tears coming out of his eyes. Hallelujah. Life wept. Hope wept. Victory wept. The fountain of wisdom wept. Weeping always carries a a picture of limitation when people weep it seems to communicate hopelessness or despair and the bible says jesus wept as god he never cried but when he became a man he cried jesus was angry the bible does not hide his frustrations he went into the temple and flogged people in anger he caused a fig tree because he was hungry and came to the tree and the tree would not deliver and he caused that tree. Look to Jesus. Listen to me. There will be moments in your life where you truly will not be able to find answers intellectually. That's why there is a realm of peace that surpasses all understanding. That means that peace is beyond the realm of arguing what is this, what is that. Remember at the apex of, of, of Job's problem, the wife was even confused. She said, curse God and die. And Job said, no, why do you speak like one of these foolish women? He said, all the days of my appointed time, I will wait. I don't know what is happening to me. Different people came and started communicating several opinions. And Eli, who one time shot them, and he said, You guys, I respect you. I wanted to speak, but I have a limitation in age. He said, But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty maketh men of understanding. Job himself, who encouraged himself in the Lord, got to a point where he was angry. And when you read chapter 38, the Bible said he summoned God. He said, God, I've finished comforting myself. We need to talk. Please come and explain to me the reason behind this pain. And the Bible says God came in a whirlwind and a discussion began. Hallelujah. Look unto Jesus. Number two. Depend on him. Number two now, let me give you number two. Commit to prayer, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of hopelessness, even in the midst of despair. Commit to prayer. That is the second point. James chapter 5 and verse 13. James 5, 13. 
is any among you afflicted let him pray the bible says let him pray when you see afflictions you see despair you see all kinds of things he says to pray it is difficult to pray when you are in pain that is where spirituality is tested lord i do not know what is happening but i pray i pray hallelujah first thessalonians 5 17 he says pray without season first thessalonians 5 17 pray without season someone say prayer shout it again say prayer prayer is very very powerful when you do not know what to do pray it is in the place of prayer that direction comes when you do not know what to do pray pray even in the spirit pray in your understanding i don't know where the solution to these bills will come from there's already a death sentence around my life and my children health wise you do not know what to do pray the Bible says the biblical recommendation for managing affliction is to pray. Man of God, pray. Businessman, pray. It does not take a certificate to pray. It takes hunger and passion and the recognition that there is a God that rules over the affairs of men. Say pray. pray. Commit to prayer. That is the second biblical key. Every time you do not know what is happening in your life, that is not the time to start running from pillar to post, discussing things with people who don't have the power to solve your problem. Can I tell you the truth? Running around will only deplete the energy that is left. Use that same energy, lock the door, and begin to pray. And sometimes, you honestly may not know how to pray. You may allow your tears to do the prayer. And while you sing, or you may allow prayer to just come from any material while you soak in the glory there pray 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 I thought I would get the job now this is the 10th year 15th year 5th year without a job pray someone in the hospital has already said forget about me just focus on the children as for me I am going pray Listen to what I'm telling you and please take it seriously. Pray. Man of God, since pandemic, it looks like your ministry just went down. The key is to pray. Discussion may be consoling, but you have to pray. You can pray yourself to comfort. You can pray yourself to faith. Prayer is like exercise. Nobody likes it, but you have to start. Once you start, something happens to you. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs What a privilege to carry everything Most people will do any other thing but pray they will cry which is human and which is okay but they will not pray prayer has nothing to do with um, whether you have the appetite and the desire it is a requirement you must pray number three let's hurry up is God speaking to someone number one look to jesus meaning depend on him even when you do not understand him the word trust is the word bata trust in the lord that means to throw yourself at him expecting him to hold you and like the hebrew boys that even if you do not deliver us oh king we have made a determination that as far as jesus as far as god is concerned we will not bow that's why you see conditional christianity is dangerous the kind of christianity that says god i will only serve you based on the fact that you bless me no god is a covenant keeping god but our love for jesus and our love for the things of the spirit must be beyond the results that come that even if I'm in the midst of fire and rescue does not come, let it be that I die trusting him. Are we together? Number three, what is the third approach to dealing with afflictions as a believer? Are you ready? Meditate upon and speak the word over that situation. Meditate upon 
and speak the word over that situation. Meditate upon and speak the word over that situation. Joel chapter 3 and verse 10. Joel chapter 3 and verse 10. Joel, Joel, J-O-E-L, chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. It says, let the weak say. Hold on. Where do you have the strength to say when you are weak? There is always strength to say, even when there is no strength to do. You may not have the strength to do, but God will always ensure that the strength to say remains with you. That when you lose every kind of strength, there is within your spirit man the strength to say. The strength to say gives you the strength to do. Let the weak say. Let those who are crying say. Let those who are discouraged say. That means in the mind of God, there is no situation that happens to the believer that should make him lose the ability to say. There is always strength enough to say. Let the weak say, I am strong. He never said, let the weak say strength. I am strong to personalize it and to believe it. Let the weak say, I am strong. Isaiah 3 and verse 10. Isaiah 3 and verse 10. Say unto the righteous, the same righteous with many afflictions. He said, say to that righteous that it shall be well with him. Someone say it must be well with me. In fact, say it is well with me. Prophesy to yourself, say in the name of Jesus, I decree and declare that it is well with me. Don't mind what the devil is saying. Say in the name of Jesus, I decree and declare that it is well with me. Say unto the righteous that it shall be well with them. Yes, I know I will come out of this. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the person in debt say I will come out of it in the name of Jesus because thanks be to God that causes us to triumph. Say unto the one who has lost the breadwinner in their family, father is gone, mother is gone and you are alone. I may not see wind, I may not see rain, but one thing I know is that my valley shall be filled with water because there is Abba, the one who never dies and the Bible says that if he can cloth the lilies of the valley and feed the birds that do not sow and do not reap they are violating a fundamental spiritual law yet in it they never lack hallelujah meditate on and speak the word can i tell you when you learn to speak the word is not a pentecostal suggestion speaking the word is part of the frame do you know god is very powerful and he has taught us the bible says he created us in his image and in his likeness his likeness means to function like him and all through scripture we see god create by speaking he blesses by speaking he restores by speaking he lifts by speaking every time god opens his mouth something leaves his mouth that ministers life to creation the bible says even for man that he breathed upon that man to breathe upon the man does not mean he used his nose. He opened his mouth and life came and entered into that man. Are we together? Speak the word. Psalm 107 from verse 2 and 3. Psalm 107 from verse 2 and 3. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the blessed of the Lord say so. Let the healed of the Lord say so. Let the lifted of the Lord say so. It's not enough to know so, you must say so. Whom he had redeemed from the hand of the enemy, verse 3. It says, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and the north and the south. Say so. 
say so in the name of Jesus I'm coming out of this situation in the name of Jesus the Lord is my light and my salvation of whom shall I be afraid of I may not understand what is happening to me but in the name of Jesus the Bible says all things work together for my good I expect glory at the end of this confusion I may not know what the process is all about but I know the end that the end is glory and is glorious and upon that I place my faith learn to say so Learn to say so. You don't say what is happening. You say what the word of God says. Hallelujah. Meditate upon and speak the word over that situation. Is someone learning? That means as you return back now, you can carry whatever is the, is the basis for the challenge, the affliction, whatever it is. You continue to make declarations. Even if it looks like it's a hopeless situation, like death, because the most... Um, the, the, the most hopeless thing that can happen to a man as far as this side of God's kingdom is concerned is that the person passes on to glory. So physically you may not see the person again. Even at that, you may not have the person back again but you can decree and declare in the name of Jesus. I know that the comfort of the spirit is at work in this family. It may be a difficult thing but by the power of the Holy Spirit with each passing day strength is released upon us and whatever role that person played in the name of Jesus God will come through. God will raise men in multiplied ways to play that role. See, there is a way the believer was designed to function. When you allow emotions to drive the vehicle of your Christian life, you will end up being a disaster. Sincerely so. You will need to push emotions aside and peg yourself at the word of God. No matter what you feel, that which God said, you must say. Are we together? The word confession comes from the word homologio. It means repeat as you have heard. And the purpose of repeating it is for creation, not just for emphasis. I prophesied as I was commanded and there was a sound. Is someone learning already? I'm giving you biblical keys. Number one, I said, look unto Jesus, depend totally upon him. Number two, commit to prayer. Number three, meditate upon and speak the word of God over that situation. Over that situation. Because every situation has an ear. And believe me when I tell you, it can hear the word of the Lord. Are you ready for number, number four? Now listen carefully. Please listen carefully. Number four, seek comfort, prayer, and help from friends and the family of believers i will take it slowly seek comfort the righteous now in the midst of affliction seek comfort comma prayer and help from godly friends and from the family of believers this is you can start this because it is a very major secret to overcoming affliction Seek comfort, prayers, and help from friends and the family of believers. In Acts chapter 4, when we read from verse 21, please give us Acts chapter 4 and verse 21. Remember when Peter and John were threatened as a result of the man at Get Beautiful who had been healed? So when they had further threatened them, it says they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. Next verse. It says, for the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. 23. And being let go... They went to their own company. Everybody said their own company. So they had a larger community of believers where they could resort to, to find company. The Bible says, and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had done. And together as a company, verse 24 now, the Bible says, when they heard the company, they lifted their voice. Say they. Not just the one person. He came to a company of believers and they could find comfort. They could pray together. They lifted up their voice unto God with one accord. Listen, many believers do not survive afflictions 
and tragedies and negative situations because they lack these four points. Many believers do not have a larger company of friends and like-minded believers. Did you know it is a terrible thing for a believer to not be connected to a larger body of believers? Because when, when disaster strikes like this, no matter how powerful you are, you will need the company of believers to shield you and encourage you. There are times the sermon you hear will not come from yourself. It will come from someone else speaking to you. Are we learning? 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 25. It said, brethren, pray for us. There are times that as much as you may want to pray for yourself, you may not have that energy. But there should be some brethren that you can honestly say pray for us. Even though we are apostles, do you have the brethren that can pray for you? Do you have the brethren that can love you, that can come and shield you? Hallelujah. Philippians 1.19. Philippians 1.19. For I know, Paul is speaking, that this shall turn to my salvation. How? Through your prayer. Paul, the prayer warrior, is saying, I require the prayer and the shield of other believers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. For this fourth point, I wrote something very interesting here and I please want you to listen. I said, living an isolated Christian life will not profit you in the day of adversity. Living an isolated Christian life. Hallelujah. An isolated Christian life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, when you read from verse 9 to 12, it talks about the power of unity. Two are better than one, it says, because they have a good reward for their labor. Reading to verse 12. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he had not another to help him up. It says, and again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Verse 12 now, it says, and if one prevail against him, it says two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. Living an isolated Christian life will not profit you in the day of adversity. Can I tell you? Having brethren, having godly friends, and having a family of believers who love you and know you and support you will require you sowing seeds of love, sowing seeds of care, and sowing seeds of help to believers too. You have to make those investments waiting for these days. Now, let me tell you the truth. The proof of your being connected to a spiritual family is not attendance, it's genuine connection. Connection that is proven by service and your own impute also. Attendance does not mean you have a spiritual family. Have you registered your impact by registering your love, by registering your care? Who knows you are there? Who has been a beneficiary of your kindness? There are many people who attend believer meetings, but nobody knows them enough to come and knock on their door and say, I heard that you have been crying for the past two days. You have blessed me too much. I will not leave this place. Your home is my home. Your tears is my tears. Let me tell you, woe betides a man who has not spent his life investing and sowing seeds of love, seeds of kindness, because you will find, do you know, there are believers who go through pain and they go through it alone because they have not made any commitment to anyone nor any spiritual family enough. No track record of service, no track record of giving, no track record of prayer, no track record of support. They just freelance participation, unfortunately, for those people who are betides that believer. Do you know there are many believers who have cheaply come out of affliction because of the power of a larger body of believers? Why is your face gloomy like this? I've not been able to pay my rent. I'm not an irresponsible person. It's just that things have been happening in my life. How much is the rent? Ah, I'm even afraid to say it. It's 1.5 million. And you may not even know the person you are talking to. He will say, come and see me tomorrow. You thought he will give you rent. He will give you the key of a house. And say, I have watched you. Every time when it's time to collect offering, I see your service in the house of God. I, you always have that smile, that glow when people are sad. 
I've taught you that challenges are as large as the ignorance of the victims. You see. Invest in strategic relationships. There are many of you who will not call on anybody. When you hear that people are sick, it's none of your business. When you hear that someone is in trouble, it's none of Once it does not affect you, it is none of your business. No. Rejoice with them that rejoice. Weep with them that weep. And you'll be making investments and you will be surprised. Moments where you need help, the body will come and wrap their hands around you and say, no, let that sword pierce us instead of touching you. You have made too much commitment. There was a woman in the Bible, you remember? That some, a woman who died in the Bible and people came and said, look at what she, this woman cannot die. Who will continue doing this? Can I tell you? You can prolong your life using your kindness and benevolence. Your contribution to the program of God can be so significant. God will not allow any devil to take your life. Are we together? This will require you sowing seeds of love, sowing seeds of care, sowing seeds of help to many believers matthew chapter 5 and verse 7 it says blessed are the merciful jesus was teaching it says for they shall obtain mercy galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 there is such a concept as the household of faith it says as we therefore as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men. Say, do good to all men. Then it says, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Can I tell you, you have heard me say it, but let me repeat it. If your absence is not missed, it means that your presence was not contributing much. You know that you are an active contributor to the program of God because people should be able to detect your absence. Where is that lady who always smiles on Sunday, whose glow can even, if you are sad and you look at that lady, where is she? And someone says she lost her mom. You say, well, I don't know her, but let me know where. Can I send something to that lady? Believers are quick to wrap their hands around people who become active contributors to the growth of others. There are others, listen to what I'm telling you. This is very powerful. It is a terrible thing to not have a friend, to not have somebody who loves you and believes in you, who can cry. You see believers go through situations alone. No. Let me repeat number four again for emphasis. Seek comfort, prayers, and help from godly friends and then from the family of believers. It's a culture in this ministry to make sure that all who are genuinely connected to this ministry as much as possible are shown the care and the love that is needed as much as God can grant us grace to do. I do not believe in using people. I believe in people being blessed. And for as long as God grants us the grace, we'll continue to extend hands of love and benevolence all wise as much as God grants us grace. Hallelujah. I would want you to do something for us. If you are new here, kindly hit on that subscribe button for us. And then like this video as well. Share to your family and friends to bless them because we know that this message will be a blessing to their body, to their soul, and to their spirit. We would need you to do one thing for us too. Tell us in the comment section where you were watching us from. And if you've got any testimony for us, kindly share with us. Thank you for watching.